Welcome to Order Military Radio TV, and we're live following Catholics. And what we do is all for free and for our love of Jesus Christ and for our Holy Mother to church. We'll defend our Holy Mother to church. Today we are re-recording our episode on the death and murder of Jack Ryan and with Brother Alexis Bonolo. Thank AJ for having me on this uh, episode of the life and here the life of the Catholic hero Jack Ryan. We've come to the final show, you might want to say, on the important mystery of his death. Um, did you want to read a statement before we began? <clears throat> We're redoing the show because we did the show yesterday, but um, our little online friendly troll uh, <laughs> monitor, it zapped the recording. So yeah, the recording was never made. So we're doing it again. It's actually, we're going to do it better the second time. Yep. I want to say how sorry we, we are to learn that Simon Seguin passed away on the 21st of February. We learn she and her family listened to our programs. She was the one in the French underground to protect Jack when his B-17 went down. To our listeners in Vietnam, Saigon, Hanoi, help us to see the official police report on Jack's murder. Uh, put it online so we can read it with Google Translate. And this way we can understand what he, what was put into, into the report. Yeah, we're going to be kind of limited in what we can say since the police report doesn't seem to have been covered in Mr. Sullivan's book. Let's show everyone Mr. Sullivan's book, this great book we've been reading from. I encourage you to get a copy. There's a lot more information in it. The Murder of the Real Jack Ryan by Daniel P. Peace. Sullivan. Uh, this is one of the books every Catholic in the United States should have a copy of. Uh, it's a great part of our history. <clears throat> And uh, Jack was a great, one of the great Catholic uh, statesmen of his time to help build up the police in, in Laos, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Did a lot of good for a lot of people. From a very patriotic and uh, generous family. Uh, his father was a policeman. His his brother was in security. Uh, he, uh, he gave a good example, and other members of his family followed in that career so <clears throat> since we mentioned Sagun's passing we'll start the story of Jack's murder there so Jack this is the this is when 1965 the uh, Vietnam War officially begins in like March or April when uh, the U.S. begins send military units over Jack has been there since January and he's given some leave, some vacation time. So at the beginning of June, what does Jack do? We'll review that again. So at the so in June of 1965, Jack first he goes to Indianapolis to meet uh, up with George and George's wife Midge and their two daughters, Diane and Patty. Diane remembered serious discussions about the situation in Southeast Asia, and on one major item caught their attention. Jack was taking out $25,000 more in his life insurance because of the danger in Saigon. So when Patty overheard talk about her uncle, uncle hiding in the back seat of a car while being driven through Saigon. Everybody knew that this was scary and very serious. She said. He was being targeted for a long time. She had spent time with Jack, Bonnie and Randy when they were living in Michigan and felt close to her uncle. But this trip wasn't a good reunion for her. Those are some important facts. And then after visiting his brother, actually he's already running a security company there in. Uh, <clears throat> um, Indiana, he heads back to his hometown. Yeah. So Minneapolis. What is who does he visit there? 
He visits his um, mom, Georgette, and his dad and his son, Randy, who's living with them. And Randy's and, just starting an important moment in his life, right? Yeah. So. It was just about June 5th, just before June 15th, when Randy was on his way to leave Minnesota for California to join the Marines. Mm -hmm. And um, so after spending about two weeks with his family, he heads out to Michigan. Yeah. Michigan State, where he had been running the organization, though he's not with them anymore, he's with the organization of public security. So he goes there and has some interviews there. And then he's like, hey, we need to go to Washington. So on June 28th, he goes to Washington until July the 2nd. OK, he now, meetings. Yeah. I uh, we left out one important fact. While he's in Minneapolis, Ed, his father, arranges that he does his final public interview with like a radio or a newspaper in town. Yeah, the Minneapolis uh, Tribune. But certain other interviews get published in this time by reporters in the United States claiming a confidential source in South Vietnam and talking about misappropriation of government funds. This is one of Jack's. Jack's was known to complain about this. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's in Washington and he meets with he meets with what the head of uh, the head of OPS or? head of OPS USAD USAD. And this is on and he does that on February second. Um, I mean June, July second. June twenty eighth to July second. Second, yeah. Now, uh, and then he immediately flies to Paris to visit his uh, his wife and his daughter Catherine. Yeah. Um, one week after this meeting. McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and a whole bunch of top officials go to South Vietnam. Uh, President Johnson's planning a military buildup, and they hold a lot of important meetings. Uh, it's kind of strange that Jack would get this leave right this time. They wouldn't have him there during all these important meetings. And this is one of the, the key facts because uh, I have to get anthropology. When you are working with cliques, and the clique has decided you're going out and you're no longer a member, they start holding meetings without you because they've already decided you're out. Uh, so this is the first big major contextual fact that um, puts doubt on the narrative they're going to hear about how Jack was murdered. Yeah. Jack spends his time in France and then he heads back he f he leaves Paris, we think, on July 21st, Pan Am. He's probably taking Pan Am because they have a round the world flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would have flown back to Saigon, got there on the, and Sullivan and Sullivan picks up the story again on the 22nd. Yeah. Of July. So Jack returned to Saigon on Thursday, July 22nd after a trip of more than 6000 miles from France. By the end of the next day, he lay dead outside his home. The chill that begins with his death is littered with inconsistencies, contradictions, and probabilities. Mm -hmm. And now this is what makes it a murder mystery. The second important fact is he's murdered the day after he gets back from France. So he's still suffering Jekyll Ag. The murder takes place shortly before 11 at night. So he would be thinking that's more like um, uh, 11 in the morning. I think there's a 12 hour difference. Uh, though when he says a 6,000 mile flight, that doesn't really sound like a flight from, from Paris, but it could be flight from New Delhi, so. Okay. If you want to murder someone, you want to get them when they don't expect it, when they're disoriented and when you have the advantage. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> Jack is murdered. Is he murdered by himself or is someone get murdered with him? He is murdered with uh, Nijin Thai Hai. Okay, so who is Nijin Thai Hai? She is also worked for the Office of Public Safety. And uh, uh, who's her husband? 
is a Vietnamese Air Force officer. Okay. And um, where are they murdered? Okay, so Jack is murdered right at the front gate. And he shot from the right to left of his head and right behind the ear. Okay, so the front gate of his residence where? Yeah, at the... The Johnson, Drake, and Piper compound on the Tian Son Nu Airport. Okay, so this next is... Next to you, Alexis Johnson's home. Okay, so this is an important thing. We don't... We can't show you a map and show you exactly where this is, but right alongside the airport, on the northern side, I believe, north northwest side, there's this long strip. And this contracting company had built a compound there with 20 houses. And um, rather important Americans were staying there. And we have the deputy American ba ambassador, Ural Alex Johnson, is his neighbor. Uh, he's right, who's right across the alley from him. He's, he's murdered right in front of his house. What do we know about this house? It's two stories. Uh, the maid lives on the ground level. His room's on the second level, and there's a light outside on every night. But is the light on that night? No, it's out. Is it, was that the only night the light didn't work? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the third big fact. <laughs> the light doesn't work. What do you know immediately in a murder case is there was, this was premeditated. This was not a crime of passion. OK, uh, it didn't occur spontaneously. Someone planned it. OK, and it means that either the murderer got there before or he had an accomplice. And he also kind of strongly suggests he has an accomplice after the fact because someone has to fix the light if he damages it. And that is never explained how that happens, although it could be just unscrewing a light bulb. Okay, what is the murder weapon? It is. Let's see. It is a thirty-eight. Let's see. Thirty-eight caliber, thirty-eight special, some nose revolver of uh, Smith Smith and Wesson. Okay, and that's and, inferred. Yeah, is that inferred because they found the weapon or inferred from the bullets? Uh, the, the weapon, and it is also the weapon of choice of the OPS in the police on Saigon from the uh, OPS training program document. Okay, yeah, this this is the gun the U.S. government supplied the South Vietnamese police. But what's unusual about this gun? That it was the rear model that held seven rounds instead of six. Mm, this is it. And we know how many shots are made because Jack gets shot, what, three times? She gets shot three times. And then the maid gets shot at once. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to the maid. Do we know her name? Um. Well, what is her testimony, at least? That okay. she rushed outside hearing the shots and was fired upon by a man who jumped on a motorbike and sped away. OK, so uh, this motorbike, whose motorbike is it that is used? OK, so. Um, it's probably Jack's. OK, uh, and this is if it was Jack's. That means the assailant didn't have his transportation nearby. But um, you would be if you were stalking someone and un unscrewed the light bulb. Why would you take someone's motorcycle if yours is in as far as we know? The assailant lives in that compound, although he might live in the town. 
And where does he end up fleeing? He ends up fleeing a, a great distance away, but not where you expect. We'll get to that in a moment. So those are the individuals in the thing. In who is the suspect, the prime suspect for this murder? So the prime suspect is Robert V. Kimball. Okay, and Kimball is um, a major. little a major. He's a major in the U.S. Special Forces. Mm -hmm. um, when he was before he was joined Jack's outfit, he was there for OPS and telecommunications, and he was transferred to logistics. And what was his job, as far as we know, as a logistics uh, a officer? Go around and drive and drop off supplies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think uh, a Green Beret would be a truck driver. He might be singing Hot Shot. This interesting thing is, is if he's just a logistics specialist riding Hot Shot um, or driving trucks, uh, how long has he been in the country? Is he really expert, or did he just get there? Yes. They don't say. Yeah, I think we. I think you mentioned earlier to me that he arrived in February. Yeah. yeah so this is July. He's only been a few months, and um, maybe he drove Jack around. Okay, he's OPS. He's a major. Maybe he lives in that compound. We we don't know. Um. um Now, who are the other important people? Let's talk about his neighbor. His neighbor is the deputy ambassador. Yeah. Uh, Earl Alexis Johnson, one of the, uh, a man who has spent his entire life in American diplomacy and was quite influential. And um, we don't know if he testified. We don't know where he, uh, for the trial or gave to the police a testimony. We don't know if uh, he was even in the house that night. Chances yeah. are, since the Secretary of Defense is in town, he's in town that night. But he wrote memoirs. And what does he say in his memoirs about this murder? He doesn't mention it. Doesn't mention it at all. Is that even possible? Someone's murdered in the house right next door to you. And you don't mention all. However, in his memoirs, he talks about all the important people came into town. And on the 28th of July, just five days after Jack's murder, Johnson makes a decision to increase military presence in South Vietnam. So was, was Jack one of those in favor of increased military? No. Was the ambassador, the assistant ambassador? No, he wasn't either. And neither was the American ambassador who was... Um, um, Cabot. Yeah. What was his full name? Cabot Jr. <clears throat> he was yeah. a, rep a Republican appointee outgoing. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who didn't want this military buildup. So Westmoreland had just come into the country. The Westmoreland had been there since the spring, and Westmoreland was, you know, we need uh, troop buildup. Strange thing about Westmoreland is he was a staff general. He wasn't a tactician or a strategist. He didn't know squat mm -hmm. about squat, and events will prove that. Uh, who was MacArthur? Was MacArthur in favor of a troop buildup? No. And um, what happened to Mac Was MacArthur alive in 65? I uh, see here. Well, no, he died in 64. And, and he died a natural death or did he die of some kind of strange disease? Strange, rare disease. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> because, you know, if he wasn't dead, maybe someone would have asked someone in Congress has said, why is not he leading our armed forces in South Vietnam to victory, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's the um, prime minister of Australia. Yeah. Who had troops there and was going to pull them out. And we're talking about January 1965 now. This is just six months before Jack's murder. Mm -hmm. um, he goes to his doctor, and what does his doctor give him? Uh, medicine to... And the medicine affects his 
being able to go swimming. Yeah, so he goes, that's like on a Thursday, and then he spends a weekend out uh, in the uh, countryside on the beach with friends. On Sunday morning, the national paper runs an article that says what? Uh, you should not go swimming. It might be dangerous to his health. T telling the entire nation about what his doctor gave him in medicine, what doctor advised him to do. Can you imagine that? So what does the prime minister do? Does he follow that advice? No, he goes swimming. And what happens to him? He's never seen again. That's the perfect psychological assassination. You profile a person. You say, you know, if you're publicly embarrassed, how do you react? Are you going to accept it or are you going to do the exact opposite? Then once you know that about a person, you go, well, we just have to kill him by getting him to drown because no one will ever know. That's the perfect crime. Yeah. No one was guilty. So you have the doctor prescribe him a strong medicine, and then you tell him to do something that he can't do with, and he's on that medicine. Yeah. So Never found. Body was never found. This is one of the mysteries in Australia. Yeah. So either people tied by explosion or ter so-called terrorist attack in Vietnam or later on in life they were they were found dead with heart attacks but you gotta remember folks at that time the CIA had a weapon called the heart attack gun mm -hmm. and from our program on JFK we, we talked about how they had scientists working on how to give people cancer all kinds of diseases from mm -hmm. an injection and stuff so it was, it's something the CIA had now did the CIA have any facilities near Jack's house yeah so in the late 50s 58 or so the kid the kids who were living there they wanted to see what was on the other side of the fence. They they went underneath the fence and found the CIA headquarters of their planes and stuff. Yeah, so we don't know if the CIA was using a hangar at their Air Force Base in 65, but they probably were. Now, AJ, uh, we'll talk about the murderer, uh, Kimball. What's his full name again? Robert V. Kimball. Robert V. Kimball. And he has a degree from what? From Idaho. I think it's Idaho State. Yeah, he's a geologist. He's a geologist and he's driving trucks. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? No. He's a Green Beret and he's driving trucks. Does that make sense to you? No. A, a Green Beret is a professional what? Killer. Okay, so... <clears throat> Now, well, um, those are the people and facts, the major ones that we'll find. We'll discuss more after the murder. Now we'll talk about what Kimball claims happened. You have to remember that other than the maid uh, who says she, a man shot at her and uh, and the other there's 13 witnesses mentioned in the police report. We don't have access to that, so we can't tell who who they are, who these 13 are. You think the uh, deputy ambassador would hear those shots right across the alley? Doesn't say anything. Maybe he did testify. We don't know. So we're just drawing the facts from Sullivan's books. Yeah. So there's no witnesses to what happened. Kimball's story is the only story, but he is also the prime suspect. So you cannot believe anything he says, but you can examine it to see if it jives with the facts. So what is his story? So Kimball told Saigon police he had known Madame High for two years, they had, that they had been very close and intimate. So then on, on that Friday night, Kimball and Madame High met for dinner at a restaurant, and he said that each had four beers. When he confronted her with his suspicions, she told him that she and Jack had only met alone in regards to an OPS staff member with whom she had been having difficulties. Afterwards, she and Kimball went to, to the, went to the home of another US mission employee and had one or two more beers before he took her home. 
Then Kimball said he stalked out Madam's high residence from the local cafe and drank two more beers before heading home just around 11 p.m. curfew. He said that while en route, he saw Jack driving in the opposite direction and, and turned to follow, suspecting he was going to pick her up. He said he watched as she lay down in the back seat of Jack's car to avoid being seen after curfew. Kimball navigated traffic more quickly on his Honda motorbike and arrived first at Jack's home. Confronting him at the gate in front, he said Jack told him that they could discuss any problems at the office, and at that point, Kimball rushed to the car and opened the door, telling Madam Hyde to get out. An argument broke out, Kimball said, when he accused her of tricking both him and Jack and acting like a prostitute. He told police that Jack punched him in the face, knocking him to the ground. He then turned to reach into his right pocket. He said he knew Jack always carried a danger. Kimball said he then went crazy, pulled out his 38 caliber stub nose revolver and shot Jack. So, yeah. Then, then what happens? What is what does Madam High do? And he says Madam High ran towards him, screaming, and he shot her. Okay. And uh, what else does he say he do does now? Then Kimball said he fled in panic, hid his gun, changed clothes, and grabbed other weapons bef before heading off on his Honda bike out of midnight toward Ben Holland, about 20 miles northeast of Saigon. Okay. Uh, the the uh, Ben Hoa is the name of the place? Yep. And that and he said this is a forest he's claiming to hide in? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> you look at a modern map, it's 32, it's 50 minutes by car. And maybe there's more traffic today, maybe there's left traffic then. Uh, but it's not around the coast, and it's not what you, if you had, AJ, if you had just committed a double homicide and you're fleeing justice, would you flee, what direction would you flee in? Towards the river to get yeah. on the boat. And... Mm -hmm. Or to the border with Cambodia to get out of the country. You're mm -hmm. going to flee to a point of safety, and actually Ben Hoa is a commando station of the Green Berets. So why would you flee there? It's also next to a, the main river that you could do to get out of the country. So you're expecting that your friends in the military are going to get you out of the country. That's pretty much his reaction. Mm -hmm. And he hides out how long? Uh, thir about 30 hours. 30 hours. So that would put it to Sunday morning. Now, Where are the bullet holes found in the bodies? And does this jive with his story? No. Okay, where was Jack shot? He shot in the left and right of the head, then right behind the ear. And um, you know something about guns, AJ. If, if someone has just punched you to ground, you're arguing with them, and you pick your gun, is there any way you can shoot him in the side of the head? Uh-oh. Where do you, a gun placed behind the ear is a sign of what? Execution. Yeah, and that you came up from behind, he didn't see you there. So this story doesn't fit with the gun shoots on Jack. If Jack just punched you, his intention would be towards you. Hmm. And you certainly couldn't shoot him on both sides of the head. And if it's just a friendly quarrel, you wouldn't do an execution style shooting. Okay. And uh... now. Where's her bullet holes found in her body? She was shot in the back, uh, running away. Then he dragged her back onto the property of Jack and shot her a few more times. Now, if you're arguing over a girl, you wouldn't kill the girl, you'd kill the guy, because then after the argument's over, you'd get on with the girl. So you would only kill her why? Why would, would be some motives why you would kill her? Uh, witnesses. The fact that she shot in the back means she was running away. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so she knew already this wasn't just a disagreement. She all know already that the, the wounds were lethal and this guy had murderous intent. Let's talk about the Derringer in Jack's pocket. Is this part of Kimball's story true? No. And how do we know? Because George told Kimball that Jack stole or got rid of that gun months prior. Mm -hmm. So either someone told Kimball about this little fact to use in his defense, or Kimball knew Jack personally enough to know that he once had that in his pocket. And this is how Kimball creates his defense. What's Kimball's defense? That it was self-defense and out of passion. Yeah, self-defense and out of passion. And now the motor the motorbike, it's a Honda. Okay, so it's a Honda Super Cub 50. And its gas tank is one gallon tank and has a 100 miles per gallon range. OK, so if he came, if he's been driving around town and he needs to flee uh, and he's going all the way to the forest of Ben Hoa, which is like 32 miles away, uh, he's getting pretty close to an empty tank. Mm -hmm. And um, so. <clears throat> you would have had to make sure you were had a full tank that night to know that you are. So the light bulbs out that shows premeditation, the shot in the back behind the ear shows that it was a surprise attack. Uh, it doesn't fit with his story that he opened the door and had her get out. And uh, it sounds to me that he she he didn't know she was in the car. And she was surprised him coming out, and that's why she's running away and he shoots her in the back. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't know she's in the car, then the whole story falls apart because yeah. then, Maybe the witnesses said they dined together. Maybe that's true, but maybe he didn't know is in the car with Jack. They're on top security. The secretary of defense is in town. He might even be staying in that compound or they might be staying at the military base. The Marines will be on higher security that night. How on earth does Major Kimball get in that compound? Well, when the police are so his clothes was muddy, so when they got on his clothes at his apartment when he changed clothes, so I'm saying I am guessing he did what the kids did he went under the fence. Yeah, and Greenberries are trained to go under the fence with their back on the ground. But you know, if you just committed a murder, are you really going to worry about changing your clothing? No. You would change your clothing if you're going to be if you knew and someone promised you to get you out of the country, though, because you'd have to have clean clothing for that. Yeah. So who takes charge of this investigation uh, of this murder? So. <clears throat> so I go and please ask Council Douglas, that is. A who Douglas Jr. To take custody of Kimball for the night because the station facilities were still inadequate, but Douglas refused. And so South Vietnam finally was accepted jurisdiction in the case. OK, so we're talking about the Saigon police. Saigon police, did they know Jack? Oh, yeah, they, they trained him. OK, so this is like, you know, their granddad. They're investing in the murder of their most well-known and honorable American that's been in, although he was in Indonesia a few years, but in the 50s, he was there training all their police, so all their policemen. Mm -hmm. So Jack and Kimball are both American citizens. Shouldn't this fall under American jurisdiction? Yeah, so. Douglas and Colonel Prue recommend that U.S. waive diplomatic immunity and leave it to South Vietnamese courts system since the crime was not committed at an American in installation. Waiving immunity also illustrates U.S. confidence in the fairness of the Vietnamese legal processes and overcomes any possible criticism of a white rot, whitewash. <laughs> the United States has no jurisdiction over this man, Secretary of State Dean Russ told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at a hearing a few days later. 
He has committed no crime against the laws of the United States and cannot be tried in American court. Does that make sense, AJ? No. <laughs> exactly. OK, so the US has military forces in South Vietnam and has had them for a while. The war has begun. The US would have a diplomatic agreement with South Vietnam to have immunity for all its personnel and its, its personnel would be under US military jurisdiction or military. Kimball especially, he's a major. Mm -hmm. Now was Kimball in the military? What do we know? I mean, was he already discharged? Did he, what did he get his car, honorable discharge? Or did he get his honorable discharge after the murder? After he serves one year. So that means he was military, which means he do, is under US jurisdiction. He's under military jurisdiction. So Rusk, we know immediately that Rusk is, is, is a, 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 a conspirator, at least after the fact in the murder, because mm -hmm. he's acting to uh, cover up the case. What is the legal effect of letting Kimball get tried in Vietnam and not in the US? So well he somewhat knew the things of the Vietnamese law, so he's like so and then his his counsel was Lieutenant Colonel John M. Rankin. Rankin. Now, Rankin was a big name. Rankin features in some important military court martial trials. And Rankin is uh, always a, uh, a lawyer that defends who? The government or the uh, convicted? The government. But he also knew every the best defense attorney in, in Vietnam. Yeah. And you know how he did it is because in May or April of 65, the State Department starts a program for cooperation between Vietnamese lawyers and American lawyers to get to know one another. So Rankin and they do like a eight or nine day conference on the radio. And Rankin is one of the individuals who gives a presentation and he does a mock case trial. Mm -hmm. So um, he's already prepared to know important lawyers that could be used to defend any American committing a crime. But the results of the case showed how significant it was to move this to Vietnamese jurisdiction because Kimball is charged with a double murder. Yeah. What sentences does he receive? So testimony wrapped up at about 7.30 p.m. after 13 other witnesses were heard and three judge panel returned an hour later. Chief Justice Nijin Van Quay announced the decision Kimball was guilty of Madam High slaying and sentenced to five years in prison with damages of 800 to be paid to her mother and 1,600 to her husband. Prosecutor Buell had asked for the maximum sentence of life imprisonment and more than 20,000 in damages for Madam High's family. But judge, the judges had accepted the exp explanation that his actions represented a crime of passion traditionally treated leniently under Vietnamese law, which at the time was based on the Napoleonic Code of France. And for the charge of murder against Jack? And the panel then announced that it acquitted Kimball of the charge in Jack's death by reason of self-defense, ruling the killer had reason to believe the victim was reaching for a weapon, even though he was unarmed. So here, here is a travesty of justice because there's only one person who claimed Jack <laughs> for a gun, and that's the murderer. You can't admit that testimony. Mm -hmm. That's just not fair in any court of system of law. If that was the case, any murderer could claim self-defense and get off. So yeah. this is very. So that means the um, the um, general count the the deputy general counsel and. Um, the American military ju uh, 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 judge who advised him the that the U.S. would waive immunity on this case knew the effects of what would happen. They're basically letting Kimball off. Now, <clears throat> Kimball goes through life. I think his case is appealed. The court rules he has to pay 20,000 damages to the husband of the wife. 
he gets that money, then mm -hmm. he's dishonorably discharged. Yeah. This is what I understand, because I know men in the military who fired a pistol once and, <laughs> and where then they shouldn't have fired it and didn't hurt anyone, they were dishonorably discharged. Or, um, <clears throat> but he goes on and has quite a nice career. What's his yeah. life afterward? Robert Kimball returned to the United States after his release in 1966 and rejoined his family. His slaying of Jack Ryan and Adrian Thai Hai apparently provided no avenue for a dishonorable discharge, and he left the U.S. Special Forces as a major. He received a master's degree in geology at Idaho State University and began a long career as a mining engineer for J.R. Simplot Co Company based in Boise, Idaho. Now, his role included the drafting of environmental impact statements for Simplot's large mining operations. Now, Simplot, is that a company that has any association with the U.S. government? Yeah. And what do they do? So Simplot was heavily involved in government work, having obtained in the start by producing dehydrated potatoes and onions for the U.S. military in World War II. The company over the years also dealt with the government in obtaining leases on public lands to extract phosphate for fertilizer and other uses. Yeah, phosphate is a, is hot, is used in incendiary we incendiary am ammunition. So this is someone who, you know, if someone in the government wanted to make Mr. Kimball have a nice life thereafter, this would be a company to help it happen. So um, this is the other big factor that this is not just a random murder because in a random murder, people don't get rewarded after. They don't get the criminal record washed. They don't get let off. They don't have sec they don't have Secretary of State telling the Senate that he's not under our jurisdiction. He didn't commit any crime. <laughs> now I'm gonna look backward at this case. <clears throat> Let's say they want Jack out of the way because he's going to be opposing a military buildup and they decide not to murder him. What, what is Jack going to do once he gets out of Vietnam? So, he was if he had lived. yeah, so if he had lived and he would have probably went to Congress and testified on all the corruption, uh, illegal spending, all mm -hmm. the exactly. Everything. Jack was already doing this and he was known to do this and he had done it to journalists that very summer. So we're at, right at the beginning of Westmoreland's scam that he begins and leads to the death of 70,000 American soldiers, Jack would have seriously endangered that scam that made wealthy the military industrial establishment that had been backed by Harriman, the head of the skull, uh, whose family controls the Brown Brothers Harriman Bank in New York, Skull and Bones. Uh, he's the one that made Skull and Bones powerful and famous. Uh, Rockefeller, who talked in favor of expanding the war. Uh, Rockefeller, I don't know how much control he had on the, the subsidiaries of Standard Oil, but uh, Esso is uh, one of those, and they were one of the big uh, gas station companies in Vietnam. We talked about that. We end up employing George and moving him in another part of the world, so he doesn't. Now, George, what's George's his reaction immediately upon hearing his brother has been murdered? I think this is some, we should cover this. It shows how great a brother he was. So when he was, when George was murdered, uh, when Jack was murdered, um, Jack was on his way home with the, Jack's body and everybody was getting ready for the funeral. And then, but George decided to go to the Saigon and to investigate it. And he took with him a video camera and then started to go and knock on doors and ask questions. And he began to find out that Jack had no gun and that the, the official OPS gun was in the case on the car seat. That means when Jack got out of the car, 
at that moment, he didn't feel threatened, mm -hmm. which means that uh, Kimball wasn't waiting there waving for him to come. Kimball was hiding. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you get to talk to Kimball? Yeah, so. Okay, so. As implausible as it seemed, George next managed to get a South Vietnamese magistrate to write a visitor pass into the jail at National Police Headquarters. He said this is against regulations, but this, is, but that an exception was being made in my case, George wrote later. On August 3rd, George came face to face with the man who had confessed to killing his brother. It is impossible to know his emotions about the about the experience because he later wrote a dispassionate account. Kimball didn't suspect who I was until he looked at me and his eyes reflected fright. I introduced myself to him. He was speechless. Now George was bigger than Jack, a foot taller and wider. Yeah, so George really restrained himself because he could have strangled that guy to death on the spot or tortured him to get out of thing. And uh, we do know that Kimball had months to prepare his defense and recite his story. But well, you can see just from the facts we presented that this story doesn't hold water, not in any detail. He even claimed he wanted to commit suicide, but he didn't have any bullets left. And yet <laughs> he had a bullet enough to shoot at the maid. Mm -hmm. Why is he carrying a seven chamber? You know, why do you carry a seven? Why would anyone have seven chamber when everyone else has a six chamber? What advantage does that give you, AJ? Just one more extra bullet. So if I fire, if you think I have a six chamber and I fire, but I have a seven and I fire six, what are you apt to do? You, you would think that your gun's empty. And so you think, OK, he's done now. We can go grab him and arrest him. Exactly. So this is a great gun to have if you are a criminal or an assassin. And um, OK, so Kimball is a major and he's a Green Beret. Jack had been in the Air Force. I'm I'm not saying Jack doesn't know how to punch people if he did, but is there any evidence Kimball was punched? No. Uh, to knock someone down. Can you hit someone in the face and not leave a mark? Mm -mm. So Kimball has no facial wound. So Kimball's Green Beret. Is there any chance that he could get sucker punched? No. <laughs> I don't think there'd be a chance. So this doesn't make any sense either that he claims that Jack punched him or Jack was we, we established Jack pulling the gun just wouldn't, you know, you know wouldn't cut it. So <clears throat> it certainly looks like Kimball was asked to kill Jack and that this had been prepared from at least February when 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 Kimball arrives on the scene working for OPS. Now you read a testimony where Kim, Kimball says he knew her for two years, so maybe he was in the Green Berets before that. Mm. Why does he flee to a green? He flees to he flees to Green Beret compound. He flees to a river where he could be exfiltrated. He he has perf He's changing his clothes. He has perfect confidence. He's going to be getting out of the country. It appears. He lived two days in the forest, right next to the compound of the Green Berets. Mm. And he changes his clothes to get absolutely clean clothes and then lives in the forest. I don't believe that at all. Unless, of course, he got into the military gear or something. Yeah. So uh, he, the, he gets total legal defense from the highest authorities in the U.S. government. He gets the best Vietnamese defense lawyers. And he's committed the murder. His, he develops a story about why he did and what he did that perfectly matches the legal system to get him off with only like a year in prison, mm -hmm. uh, which he he's not a legal expert. Someone gave him really good counsel. Someone even decided that that murder would take place in a spot where you could get the murderer off. Yeah. So we haven't we don't have the police report. There's really nothing more we can say, but. I hope that this program has given you enough information about Jack and his death to inspire you to start investigating because you, there could be a lot 
of Freedom of Information Act that could get more information. And this might seem outlandish, but I think there should be a congressional investigation of this murder. Jack yeah. served America in an outstanding way in an important time. He was one of the great heroes of the Cold War, and his death just doesn't the facts of his death and the, what happened to the alleged perpetrator just don't jive. And I'm sure there's phone calls, messages, notes left somewhere in some archive that gives us more light about what happened and what Jack's superiors thought of him. Yep. Um, what are what would you like to say in closing, AJ? That. To me, you're right. Don't ever believe the nonsense that what swayed the other side of your family. You were right, Randy. Your dad was murdered for being a good guy. Literally. And there needs to be investigations, names on plaques erased. I mean, saying certain guys are heroes and buried in Arlington. When in fact, the only guy who should be buried in Arlington is buried in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So I highly encourage you to get a copy of this book and read about Jack Ryan, and uh, not just because of the mystery surrounding his murder, because um, as I've said before, he's a great example for Catholics serving in professional life or even in the government. Uh, but there's a lot of facts in there that might lead you to discover things. And AJ's put a whole slew of documents on the show page today that we just dug up that uh, Sullivan may have used or not used. I don't know, but there's probably a lot more out there. And if you find them, send AJ the URL. Mm -hmm. And um, if anyone knows more about this case and would like to come on Auto Militaris Radio TV, AJ, would you like to have them on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so... Um, uh, this is this is this is a uh, 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 this is something that deserves attention, and uh, our condolences to the family for the death of Jack. Uh, and um, uh, I was only one year old at this time, so this is way way back in time. But there's still this there's still a lot of you know a lot of paperwork that's been found that mentions Jack, and uh, that police report contains some things. The trial, we this transcript of the trial, if one was made, would be very interesting to read. But um, I people might say the Vietnamese justice system wasn't working because Kimball was basically given a light sentence. But as an anthropology, I, anthropologist, I think that what was in the mind of the Vietnamese was this. America's helping us. We can't find one of their men guilty. That just wouldn't be hospitable. So the light sentence had nothing to do with the case. It had to do with their diplomatic relations with the United States. And putting the case in their hands guaranteed that result, was if the guy was tried in military court for killing a civilian, was well, not even a civilian, he's the State Department, so he's diplomatic, uh, he wouldn't have gotten a much stiffer trial. Yeah. And you don't let someone off unless you asked him to do the hit. Mm -hmm. So thank you, AJ, for having me on this uh, episode of The Life of Jack Ryan, Catholic Hero, The Murder Mystery. Yep. This is Auto Military Studio TV signing off. Day is full. Day is full.